Hey, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Let me see if I can get this going here. Um, so I'm very happy to be here at uh, BrewCon. Um, it's been on my bucket list to come. It's my first time coming here. Um, I've known Wim for a few years. I've known people who, from the States who've come over here and they've said it's a great community, a great conference to come, come, and, uh, come and see and uh, be part of. So um, when I got invited to come speak, I was very excited and uh, I jumped at the chance. So thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, so, since I'm an old guy, now I get to talk about the history of, 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 of hacking. And, um, you know, I talked to some people and I realized that, you know, some people don't know, you know, w what was it like before hackers started to engage with the professional security community? Uh, there was a time when hackers were completely outside of the professional security company. You know, you might have had a system administrator job, but you didn't work uh, on, you didn't actually work in a job doing security, either consulting or um, you know, building security products or things like that. And then gradually over time, hackers became what I consider the security industry. And so there's, there's, a, there's a path there that I, I want to talk about today. Um, so uh, this is uh, me and my uh, hacker crew from 98, uh, Loft Heavy Industries, testifying at the U.S. Senate. So just by a show of hands, how many people have heard of the loft before? So about half, half the people, so that's pretty good. Um, so I wanted to start here because I think this is sort of in the middle of this journey from hackers being outsiders to hackers being insiders. And, um, you know, how, how, did, how did we get there? How did we get up on... Uh, you know, up on this panel talking to the U.S. Senate about computer security. Why did they come to hackers to, to, to find out about what the government should do about security and how, how bad is it? So first, that's me there. Um, I had a little bit more hair. It's a little less gray. Um, and, uh, but how did, how, did, how did we get here? How did we get to this, this point? And um, what we did was we made trouble. Right? We got noticed. And we made a lot of vendors upset. They didn't like us. We made a lot of enterprises upset. They didn't like us. We made the government upset. There were people in the government who just wanted us to go away. And we did this because we were exposing vulnerabilities in their software. And at that point in time, they didn't know how to deal with it at all. They just didn't know how to deal with what we were doing. They didn't have any process for a, a vulnerability in their software and an, an exploit code being published on the internet, they, would just, they, they just were sort of stunned and, and in vapor lock for years. They just wanted the problem to go away. You talk to these vendors and they're just like, can't you just go away? And we would say, can't you just make secure software, right? Um, so making trouble um, is an important part of the way hackers have... Um, have impacted the IT industry. We kind of shake, shake people and wake people up and we sort of make them understand that the emperor doesn't have any clothes when it comes to um, people, people doing security the right way. Um, you know, some people would say, I'm still making trouble. If you talk to Marianne Davidson of, of Oracle, she thinks I'm still making trouble because I still think that I should be able to inspect Oracle software for security vulnerabilities. And she still thinks that's a ridiculous idea that only Oracle should be inspecting their code for security vulnerabilities. We know that's not the case, but there are some people who are still clinging on to that, that notion um, from, from sort of the early 90s, even today. Um, so what was it like back before hackers engaged with the, the sort of the professional security world. This is what it was. On the, on the left-hand side there, you have the orange book. This was written by the Department of Defense. This was the way the government thought about security. This is the way that, you know, security professionals thought about security. And if you look at that, if you look at the orange book and you actually read it, it's all about security features. It's all about access control, uh, identity management, uh, logging. 
It's all about security features. It doesn't say anything about bugs. It doesn't say anything about bugs at all. Like, there's no, there's no notion that um, you would test your software to see if someone wrote the security feature even correctly, right? It was just, you build a system with these security features and you're secure. So the, the idea of security back before hackers came on the scene was developers are perfect, the design is perfect, the implementation is perfect, the system administration is perfect, the users are perfect. That is the way that people thought about about security. We just build it and everything just works. And on all those levels, hackers came and said that's all completely wrong. Users do the wrong thing, your administrators are not configuring it properly, you designed it wrong, and you wrote it with a lot of bugs in it. Right? And, and that notion didn't really, it didn't really uh, exist until people started to try to break things. Um, on the right, we have CERT here, Computer Emergency Response Team. CERT was created um, in response to the Morris Worm. So hopefully everyone has heard of the Morris Worm where Robert Morris Jr. wrote really the first internet worm which attacked SendMail. Um, and CERT was created in response because the internet community didn't have any way to deal with an attack on the, on, uh, uh, like, like the Morris Worm. The, the Morris Worm caught everybody by surprise and so CERT was formed to investigate, you know, widespread, um, you know, malware threats. And uh, so CERT was formed to do that. And the notion of CERT was if you, if you know about a malware, you know about a threat, you know about a vulnerability, you send that information to CERT and CERT will take care of it. That was, that was the notion. So what CERT would do is CERT would then go and contact the vendor and typically you'd end up with a silent patch. And no one, no one knew that they needed to install the patch. They didn't know they were vulnerable. Um, and this is why silent patches are bad because you know, attackers can reverse engineer patches, but people who have the systems, unless they know they're vulnerable and they know they need to install the patch, they, they might not install the patch. So um, we actually sent some bugs at the loft that we found in the early days to CERT because that's what you were supposed to do. We said, yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing to do. And it was just a black hole. We would send them information and they would say, oh, thank you, we'll take care of it. And you say, did you take care of it? No, we, we got it, we got it covered. Did you contact the vendor? Don't worry about it. Is the patch available? Don't worry about it. The vendor's taking care of it. And we would never even know that the bug that we created, uh, created that we found if it, ever gotten, if it ever got fixed, we said, this, is, this doesn't work. This isn't, this isn't working for us, right? So we tried with CERT a couple times and CERT let us down. So we said, there's got to be a better way. Um, and, and a lot of other people who were doing vulnerability research back then um, had, this, had the same reaction. And so CERT never really engaged with the uh, hacker community. I don't know, um, maybe a little bit today, but I think that was, that was sort of a missed opportunity um, back then. And then, so what happened was, because CERT didn't engage, hackers created their own information resources and their own way of sharing information and their own process and didn't use CERT. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. Um, so one of the things that really got my mind focused uh, in, in the direction that sort of propelled me in my career was this paper by uh, Dan Farmer and, and, and um, Witsi Venema improving the security of your site by breaking into it. So if you haven't read this paper, go and read this paper. Because it really opened, opened my eyes to the whole hacker mentality of you, you improve the security of something by trying to break into it, right? You, you try to take the adversary's approach. And up until this paper, no one had really you know, maybe someone had tried this here, but no one had actually documented a process um, to, to do that. So what, what Farmer and Venema talk about here is every time they learned of a system getting broken into, they looked at that pattern that the attacker used. You know, did they exploit trust? Did they find a system that was misconfigured? What was the misconfiguration? And they collected all these things that attackers were doing 
at, at, by, by, by you know, doing forensics and figuring out what the attackers did. And they collected this list of things and they said, well, if we go to someone's you know, uh, network, let's just try all those things and, and, and see if any of them work. And if we find things that the attacker would have gotten into using a particular technique, we'll, we'll close that hole. So this was really the concept of penetration testing, right? And so this was born out of really the hacker mentality. Um, and, and so this whole notion of, of security is actually uh, an active participatory sport where you're learning from your adversary, um, you're, you're, taking, you're, you're doing wargaming, right? You're, you're doing capture the flag exercises. You're, one, someone's taking one side, the, the, you know, the red team, one, someone's taking the blue team. This whole notion of, of, of capture the flag really was born from the hacker community in the, in the mid-90s and, and, and cons like DEF CON started a whole capture, capture the flag. So as opposed to security being this static, um, sort of you build the features, you configure your firewall, um, it was, it, hackers brought this notion of, of training, right? You train to get better at security. You, you're constantly learning from the adversary and the concept of things like honeypots to learn from the adversary were created by hackers. So then uh, one of the controversial things that, that hackers brought was the idea of a, a, a security tool, a security testing tool. And every time, uh, when these tools are first introduced, they were thought of as very bad. They were thought as evil, bad things that you shouldn't possess. They even had, like if you had an antivirus company, would even scan for the executables of these tools, and if they were found, it was, it was, it was quarantined and blocked, and you're, you, know, you, got, you got an alert, and some people got fired for using these tools. So the very first security tool that came sort of from the hacker world that I can remember is this tool called Crack by Alec Muffet, where uh, he came up with the idea of um, how can we discover if there are weak passwords uh, in, the, in the system? Well, let's try to break, crack the password, right? Let's try to break the password with brute force or dictionary attacks or some other kinds of attacks to see if the passwords are, 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 can be guessed. Um, so th this, th this originally was, was thought of as a bad thing. Like a lot of people said, why are you doing that, right? Why, why, are, you, why are you testing for weak passwords? You should just don't do that. Um, there was a uh, system administrator, Randall Schwartz, who got fired from Intel um, and, um, and uh, charged with uh, you know, a computer crime because he ran crack on the system that he was managing or the systems he was managing at Intel because he thought it was a good idea to see if there were weak passwords on the system and he was going to tell his users that they should use stronger passwords. He used crack because he thought, well, what if an attacker gets on the system and uses crack? I'm going to use crack. I'm going to improve the security of my system by using the hacker tools before the hackers do and, and use them to fix things. He got fired for doing that, and, he, and he, I, I, think, uh, I think he got a suspended sentence or something like that. Um, but that's, that's how controversial the idea of, of securing systems by attacking them was. Um, Dan, uh, Dan Farmer and, and Weetzy Venema took their ideas from um, their, their paper and wrote a, wrote a tool and automated the process. So they collected all those different um, attacks that they saw and they wrote, they, um, they wrote Satan or, uh, um, and released it publicly because it's, it's a way to automate the process of securing your network, scan all the systems for vulnerabilities, right? Network vulnerability scanning. Um, so this was the first network vulnerability scanner. Dan Farmer got fired from Silicon Graphics, his company, uh, the company he worked at. Um, when they found out that he released this tool, they fired him. You know, who, who today, uh, whose company runs a network vulnerability scanner? Probably, probably everyone, right? It's a compliance requirement now. Where did it come from? It came from the hacker community and it was thought as a scary thing. It was a scary, scary thing to find vulnerabilities because of course you're going to use that for evil, right? You're going to use it for bad. So this notion even still pervades today. But back then you got fired 
and he got charged with a crime. That's how misunderstood this mentality was. And then, um, I, I, then um, people, a lot of people may have heard of NetCat, um, which is uh, really, uh, Hobbit calls it the network's uh, Swiss Army knife, um, because it allows you to create, you know, open up arbitrary ports, bind arbitrary programs to that port, and basically, uh, you know, explore sending data over UDP, TCP on different ports, and explore things like firewall rules um, and things like that. You know, a lot of places would, um, very common hack was before uh, people had stateful uh, UDP, um, the, uh, a common hack was to bind uh, shell to a listening port on port 53, um, and, and then people would just see if you could get, uh, if you could get port, um, a connection to go through the firewall at port 53. So it was a way to test whether your, your network security was actually working um, or not. Again, NetCat was something that was scanned by um, you know, antivirus, and if it was found, it was uh, quarantined. So if you were doing actually using some of these hacker tools, you couldn't also use antivirus on your system or it wouldn't, or it wouldn't work. So, um, as I was saying that earlier with the, uh, with the fact that CERT didn't engage the hacker community, the hacker community created its own resources, right? It created new, new, new conferences. Um, so, BugTrack was created in 1993 by Scott Chasen, basically due to the frustrations of not having any other channels to talk about uh, vulnerabilities. And it became moderated in 95 by uh, Elias Levy, LF1, who moderated it from 95 to 2001, which was really the huge growth period of, of bug track. And this was, this was really this was the place to be if you wanted to talk about, uh, discuss vulnerabilities, disclose vulnerabilities. Uh, this was really, really the only uh, uh, place where that level of disclosure was happening during that, that period of time. Um, and it was, you know, it was, all, it was all out in the open. And then, of course, we all know about DEF CON, um, you know, one of the original uh, hacker, hacker cons. And um, one of the interesting things of DEF CON was in the early days, the, uh, the federal government used to send people to DEF CON to learn from the hackers. Um, and, but it was something where, for some reason, they thought this was, like, inappropriate or wasn't what they didn't want this to be seen um, you know publicly so they they went undercover so you would have a guy who did security for the Department of Defense um, you know basically uh, trying to dress like a hacker and you know no one's gonna you know notice his military haircut or something um, and uh, they actually would would try to blend in they didn't want to officially come to DEF CON as a Department of the Defense employee, because somehow there was this notion that that was wrong. So there was this idea of like security professionals affi affiliating with hackers. It was somehow dirty or wrong. It was really it was really strange at the time. Um, th th even today, um, the organization ISC Squared has in their code of conduct, um, "Don't affiliate with hackers." which I think is completely ridiculous, right? But, but it goes back to those days, if you're a security professional, a certified security professional, you don't, you don't affili affiliate with, uh, with, with hackers. Somehow, somehow you're gonna get perverted or something. I don't know what it was. But uh, what happened at, um, at DEF CON is they made it into a game. They created a game called Spot the Fed. And, um, and if, you, if, you, if you noticed someone was obviously a Fed, the game was, you, you called the person up, up onto the stage and, um, you know, you say, I spotted a Fed, and you call that person up to the stage, and then, the, you know, whoever, Jeff Moss or whoever was the, uh, the moderator would, would ask, ask the person, are, are you a Fed? And it was kind of obvious. It was hard for them to lie. Um, and so they actually um, gave the I spotted a Fed person a T-shirt that said, I spotted the Fed, and they gave the Fed a T-shirt that says, I'm a Fed. And he was supposed to wear that for the rest of the conference. Then so many feds started coming that it just got too pr prolific, and eventually they stopped doing that game. But, um, and they actually, Jeff Moss created a whole separate conference called Black Hat, which 
was supposedly like the legitimate conference that the feds could go to. But, you know, of course they still would go to both. Um, and then we had the next, one of the next things that, that came out of the 90s and came out of the hacker community was the idea that hackers started creating security products. So Chris Klaus, um, in the late 90s, created Internet Security Systems, which was the first commercial uh, network vulnerability scanner. So he took the, the idea of what Dan Farmer had done with Satan and made, it, made a commercial product um, to do that. At the Loft, we created a software called Loftcrack, and we actually sold it, targeted it at system administrators um, so they could test the passwords of, uh, of their system. So the idea was, you know, a normal system administrator could do this. You didn't need to be a security professional and sort of opened up the world of hacker tools to regular uh, IT people. Um, the first, the very first uh, intrusion detection system was created by hackers. Marcus Raynham um, started this company called NFR, Network Flight Recorder, and he hired the loft to write all of the signatures for NFR. Um, so we were involved in the very first intrusion detection system. Um, so you see these mainstays of, uh, of, of, of security today, like network vulnerability scanners and... Um, and uh, intrusion detection systems came out, came out of the hacker community. They didn't, they didn't come out of, you know, the IT security in, in the industry at the time. And then uh, ISS also wrote Real Secure, which was sort of the second I IDS uh, after NFR did. NFR was ultimately uh, not, uh, not successful as a company. So... Um, now we get to this point where we've sort of matured what we were doing at the loft. Um, and um, we, we took the notion of, you know, improve your network or your site by, by trying to break into it. And we focused it on an individual piece of software. And we built the la a lab environment so we could take a piece of software like Internet Explorer and we could figure out how to, how, to, how, to, how to find vulnerabilities um, in, in that software. And uh, so this was around 98 or so, and Microsoft started to take notice to some of the research we were doing um, because it was getting, it was getting pretty sophisticated. Uh, Mudge, uh, one of my uh, compatriots at the Loft, had teamed up with, um, with Bruce Schneier, you know, you know, famous cryptographer at the time, and um, they, they started reverse engineering the, um, the NTLM protocol where uh, Microsoft products um, authenticated over the network. And um, they found vulnerabilities in the protocol and we actually built uh, uh, brute forcing of the NTLM protocol into uh, Loftcrack. So you could run Loftcrack, you could, you could sniff the network for, uh, for, for machines um, authenticating with NTLM and then you could brute force uh, the password. So this was like going right at the core of, of, of Windows networking and was really pretty embarrassing to Microsoft. This really made them stand up and notice. They said, wow, they, these hackers are, are, are working together with cryptographers and they're, you know, they're pulling our pants down. We got to figure out what's going on here. So um, at, uh, at um, Black Hat um, one year, I think it was like 98 or so, um, they sent, Microsoft sent their, you know, their, their, their architects, their, their, their head developers on Windows, and they said, we want a meeting with you guys. We want to understand what you're doing. And um, we, we, we basically sat down and, and t walked them through the process of, you know, how do you, how do you break, how do you break a protocol? Like, how do you do that? You know, how do you set up a, a network with sniffers and then inspect the packets and understand what's happening? And how do you recreate some software that might emulate one side of the connection so you can start to manipulate it? And this was all totally new thinking um, to Microsoft. They, they, I mean, their eyes were wide open. They were like, I can't, they had no concept of the idea that, that people would actually know how to do this and know how to, how to break it. Um, and that was the beginning, I think, of Microsoft starting to think about maybe this adversarial approach to testing our software might be something we want to do. So, you know, but what's still in the late 90s, what is the, uh, you know, what's the status quo out there? 
right? We're still seeing product companies selling security features, right? People are selling identity and access management. They're selling encryption technology. They're selling firewalls. And, you know, what are hackers doing? They're showing that all that stuff doesn't matter if you have bugs, right? We'll bypass it, right? It doesn't matter that you're using SSL. We're just going to get the data at the endpoint, right? It doesn't matter that you, you don't allow inbound connections into your network. We're going to get someone on the inside to, to run our software through phishing. Or we're going we're gonna to break through some connection you expose to the internet. Um, and, you know, accountancies are still se are selling compliance. You know, the big four is out there auditing you against SAS 70 or, 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 or some NIST standard. You know, hackers, hackers are, are, are ignoring this. So, you know, the, even in the late 90s, um, even though the hacker movement is going full steam, the, the, you know, the traditional sort of security product and, and is still like not, not really dealing with the actual problem. And to some degree, we still have that today, right? Um, so in 2000, we decided that we were going to make a change and the loft essentially went pro. We decided, why don't we, you know, sort of quit our day jobs and do do what we love to do, which is, you know, vulnerability research and building security tools, why don't we go and do that full time? So in, in, uh, in, in 2000, um, we, or end of 99, 2000, we, uh, we teamed up with a company called At Stake that was still in stealth mode, which was, they were trying to build a security consulting company. And um, we decided that we would join them and become, become their security research team. And uh, we joined, one of the reasons we joined was uh, Dan Gear, uh, who was a, uh, a security luminary that, that we respected very much. Dan worked on the uh, Kerberos project at, uh, at, at Microsoft, I mean, sorry, at MIT. And uh, he was the leader of that project uh, to build Kerberos, which Kerberos is probably, you know, one of the most prolific uh, protocols. I think every operating system um, supports that code in one way or another. Um, so joining up with Dan Gear made us feel comfortable that this place probably isn't going to be a, a, a you know, a, a train wreck. We can make this work. It didn't work out quite as well as we wanted it to, um, but we tried. Um, so in 2000, we launched At Stake as a different kind of security consulting company. Um, we weren't like the big four, like uh, um, the auditors. We didn't just come in and, and, and audit you against some compliance checklist. We weren't like the consulting that security product companies did, which was, hey, let me figure out how to install my security technology and then I'll configure it for you. Uh, we, we were security consultants the way hackers would be. Right? We did our own vulnerability research, we, we did our own tools, we secured people's networks by trying to break in, right? try to break into the network. We secure, helped secure people's software by trying to, um, to break into the software. And um, you know, there, there had been some hackers that had, had tried to start consultancies in the past, and they were either too early or maybe they just weren't you know, um, trustworthy enough. I think to some degree as testifying at the Senate, um, gave us some legitimacy, um, and, and working with Microsoft gave us some legitimacy, so we were able to actually get customers. Um, and uh, so, so once our model started working, we actually, there was actually a couple companies, Foundstone, which became acquired by McAfee and Gardent, which got acquired by VeriSign, um, had a similar model. They essentially hired hackers to do hacker stuff uh, on... on uh, on their customers' networks and software. So maybe some of you remember in 2002, Bill Gates wrote the Trustworthy Computing Memo. So uh, Microsoft in the early 2000s, 2000, 2001, was getting hit by all these worms constantly. SQL Slammer, uh, Code Red, um, all kinds of worms were causing havoc for their customers. And they just had so many wormable bugs in their, net, in their networked products, it was actually existential risk for Windows NT, Windows 2000, 
as, as an enterprise um, um, software system. The, um, the, uh, I think it was the Secretary of the Air Force came to Microsoft and said, if you don't change how you're building your software, we're going to move to Linux. Um, I remember reading an article about that. And that really woke up Bill Gates. He said, wow, if the Defense Department stops using Windows and starts using Linux, our whole master plan of being the dominant enterprise win uh, operating system is, is, is going to be out the window. So uh, this is one of the motivators for the trustworthy computing memo is they have to show the industry they're going to do something about it. They're going to change. So in this memo, he says, we're going to stop, you know, we're going to stop the presses. We're going to stop the machine. All of our developers are going to read the writing secure code book and they're all going to get trained on writing secure software. And now Microsoft's going to make secure software. So, um, so it sounded good on paper. Um, the problem was they really didn't know how to write secure software. They didn't know what processes they should use. Um, there was a lot of talk, but they didn't actually know what to do. So they first hired Foundstone to come in and help them, teach them how to, how to write some secure software, work on their um, de development teams. And that, that didn't, <clears throat> for, for one reason or another, it, it, didn't, it didn't work out. So they actually um, then hired, hired at stake, the company that the loft was at, to come in and uh, teach them how to, how to write secure software. So these are some of the things uh, up here that, that we, we taught them. We taught them the uh, idea of threat modeling. They didn't know how to threat model before. They had no notion of thinking like, thinking like the adversary. How would the adversary start to pick apart the software? How would, they, how would they break that? So we taught them threat modeling. So during the design phase of building the software, they could think about design, design decisions that would make the software more secure or less secure, right? Um, so we taught them that. Um, we taught them about heap overflows. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't understand how you could possibly get um, a, a heap overflow exploit um, to work. Um, we, we taught them how to fuzz software. Um, I, uh, Dave Itell, who's now CEO of Immunity, um, wrote the first open source fuzzer during the project that we, the first project we worked on at Microsoft, we were securing IIS 6. And um, I remember Dave sitting down next to me with his Linux computer, which he had to get special permission to bring onto Microsoft's campus. They said, you can't bring a Linux computer in here and connect it to our network. It's going to like, somehow the software will leak off of that somehow, and, and all of our software will be GPL'd. Um, and uh, so he had to get special permission from some vice president to bring, bring Linux on. But he wanted Linux because he wanted to write um, this fuzzer, Spike, um, on, uh, on, on the Linux platform, and he eventually open sourced it. But we actually, he actually wrote that software and we used it against IIS 6, and Microsoft started fuzzing their products um, starting from that engagement on. Um, I remember teaching them how to use SysInternals Process Explorer to see what files um, a, uh, a piece of software was actually opening and closing in what directories, what name pipes was it using, what shared memory was it using. They didn't know how to do this, right? So their developers would write software on top of other libraries that they didn't know what those libraries were doing. So they had no idea that they were writing code that had vulnerabilities in it because they didn't, they didn't take the uh, adversarial approach and try to inspect what the software was actually doing. So now they actually would started doing that um, as, as part of their process. And actually, they eventually bought SysInternals because they had so many cool tools and, and, and cool people. Um, so essentially, when you, when you look at the Microsoft SDLC, and they wrote a book about it, um, it, that whole process, the majority of that process was created by hackers. Hackers came in, and all the techniques that we had come up with and devised, like fuzzing and reverse engineering, um, disassembling, using tools like Process Explorer, all of these techniques that we, threat modeling of course, that we came up with to attack software after they shipped it, we taught them how to do that before they shipped the software. And they called that the, the, the Microsoft SDLC. And 
they actually took that technique and they, they, they submitted it as an ISO standard. So ISO 27034, which is now how to build secure software, a lot of the techniques that are in there were, were things that hackers uh, taught Microsoft um, how to do. So, you know, hacker, hacker know-how is now an ISO standard for building secure software. So around 2003 is when I sort of think of as sort of the modern security uh, era uh, starts. You know, penetration testing is actually a requirement now. Like for compliance reasons, something that was scary, that only hackers did, you're a bad person if you do it, is now an actual requirement. You know, so it took 10 years for the IT industry to sort of absorb the hacker mentality. Um, Companies have product security response teams. They're ready, willing, and able to communicate with vulnerability researchers. Vulnerability researchers are, you know, hopefully not sued anymore um, for doing bad things. It still happens occasionally. Um, and now we've evolved even to bug, bug bounties. Um, you know, a lot of people um, don't realize that Netscape had a bug bounty way back in like 95, 96. Um, but it was still thought of as, uh, you know, sort of a scary, a scary thing to, you know, to, to allow hackers to poke at your stuff. And it really wasn't until Facebook and Google started, started having bug bounties that it, it, it sort of became a legitimate thing. And that was really only about six or seven years ago. Um, so how about, what about today? Right, 2017. So, if I say modern security era started, I think in you know 2003. Um, you know, it was 14 years later, and all the things that happened, you know, sort of before 2003, are all, all we're all it's all taken for granted now. It's like it's the world, it's the world we live in. The world has changed, but you know, it's changed in ways that you know I could never, never have predicted. You know, we had uh, you know not Petya uh, earlier this year. Um, where uh, nation state hackers um, are, are, nation states are pretending to be, you know, computer criminals. They're, they're pretending to be hackers. You know, I know if you followed the Guccifer 2.0 things that Guccifer was saying, but it's, it's I think it, most people think that that's part of the, of, of the Russian government, it's a Russian government actor, uh, actor and it, Basically, Guccifer is pretending to be a, a hacker. He's pretending to be a white hat hacker. He's, he's hacking for good. So it's getting a little complicated out there. Uh, you know, it's sort of, I guess sort of it always has been. Um, but we still have rapidly evolving threats and it's confusing who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. Um, and I could have never predicted the level of nation state hacking that, uh, that would be going on back when I testified at the Senate in 98. Uh, So the other thing is we're all insiders now, right? A lot of the guys at the loft uh, all work at big corporations now helping them with security. Um, Mudge, um, who's at Stripe now, uh, heading up their product security, um, was sort of the ultimate insider. He worked for DARPA. He worked for the Department of Defense in the US. DARPA is the, def uh, the, um, the Defense Advanced uh, Research Project. And uh, he got DARPA to fund hacker projects. Um, by being an insider, he was able to convince the, the, the federal government to take some money and give it to hackers. Like, so so a, lot of, a lot of the famous uh, hacking projects that have happened over the last few years was actually funded by DARPA. A lot of people don't know uh, when Chris Velasic and Charlie Miller hacked the Jeep that their project was funded with DARPA money. Right, so Mudge, Mudge, they, they applied for some funding and Mudge got that project approved. And so car hacking was funded by the US government. Um, so, you know, hackers being insiders now, it can be really helpful um, for, 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 secure, for security. But unfortunately we're getting, we're getting old, right? Um, and we need, we, need, we need a new generation out there doing new things, shaking things up. Um, and so, you know, this is my call to you, is for you to do something that makes me nervous. You know, back when, you know, in the mid-90s, um, when I was doing things and making people upset, 
um, you know, it seemed like I was on the right path because there were people that were nervous about what we were doing. And, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, Justine yesterday um, talking about what she was doing with the cyber short and taking a new approach to shake things up. And I have to admit, Justine made me nervous when I first, uh, when I first saw this. I, uh, I took a look at this and said, you know, how is this going to, what is the view of vulnerability researchers going to be if we're seen as, you know, sort of in this for the money, right? If, if we're in here to make, make, make money, a lot of money potentially, from our vulnerability research, and some people, you know, are scared of collateral damage. You know, are you making money at the risk of other people being harmed, right? And so I, I, I thought about it for a while, and, and at first, um, since it was new, um, I was, I was kind of skeptical. But, but then I thought back to, you know, the idea of full disclosure and, you know, putting out bugs and exploits to get companies that were, um, that, uh, that wouldn't take action when you, when you tried to engage them um, uh, in, a, in a way that they would do the right thing when they ignored you, you went full disclosure, right? And um, so I had done things in the past that probably had collateral damage, but the, the, the net benefit was, was there. You know, companies started to take security more seriously. And uh, I think a market-based approach is something that should be, should be explored um, for sure. But it, it's an example of something that, that, that uh, shakes the system up. And I think that is something that hackers have to do. Um, I, I think that, you know, we, we, we've lived in this world, this sort of what I call the modern security era, where we take for granted things like uh, penetration testing tools and, and, and finding vulnerabilities in systems is an important, good thing to do. It's not scary. Um, but I, we, we still haven't solved the problem yet, right? Um, we, we still have things like, um, you know, WannaCry taking down, you know, a hospital system in the UK. You know, um, so the system still needs to be sh sh shaken up. And so um, I'm happy to see what uh, J Justine um, um, is trying to do, um, or did, to, to, wake, to wake up um, the industry in a different way. So um, the final thing I, I want to talk about is something that um, I, I think the system needs to be um, shaken up. And I think the idea of auditing insecurity is completely broken, right? The idea that we need to do an audit at all, we need to do a test um, for, for things that are already sort of done and deployed and look for security there, I, that, that notion is completely broken, right? Because it's too late. It's too late. The system has a window of vulnerability now. The system is already in production. It's already running. Attackers already have access to it. And now you're going to find the vulnerability. So the idea of, of network vulnerability scanning um, as a way to secure your systems, we have to get rid of that notion. We have to get rid of that notion. We need to build security in. And I think that is the... If, 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 I don't think it's... It, it might be a, a somewhat radical notion. But the idea is that every developer or every IT person has to have some knowledge of security and security has to be woven into every process that they do uh, during the building and configuration process. The idea that security is an external process which is done to systems that are already built is just a broken notion, right? So one of the ways I think um, I'm trying to uh, make a difference there is with this notion of the security champion. And the security champion is someone whose normal day job is as a developer writing software or they're an IT person building, helping building a, building a system. And uh, they, they, they know enough about security to know when something is, is going wrong during the development process that, that security isn't being thought of. Uh, so one of the things that we, we, we do at Veracode, and I've been working with some other software companies to do this, is have at least one member of each scrum team that's building the software be a designated security champion. 
and have that person get extra training and meet once a month with the security team and do things like capture the flag exercises, do things like look at a particular piece of malware, look at a, a vulnerability and actually trace through the code and see how it's exploitable. Look at a, look at a new security tool. Um, because I think we need to embed the, the, the notion of, of how security works and how hackers work into, into every single process we have for building software and building IT. I think it's the only way that we can get, get out of the problems um, that we have is to make it part of that. And, and so I think education is another way to do that. Um, and I've been working with uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, an instructor at Tufts University uh, in Boston to embed um, um, secure coding um, into the normal computer science curriculum as opposed to, you know, having it be an IT security curriculum. So the idea is that every, every programmer will have to use secure coding, secure test, understand how to do secure code review, understand how to use uh, application security testing tools um, on their own code so that they, the projects that they build actually have to be secure. And that's a property of every piece of software that they do as part of their computer science curriculum. And I think that's the only way that we can actually eventually start to chip away at this, the, uh, you know, sort of the security problem. So um, that was what I had to say today. There's my contact info if you want to, uh, if you want to contact me. And uh, I guess I'd be happy to take some questions. I think we have some, some time. <laughs>